Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, uh, another webinar of a series of Wednesday webinars. Uh, so I'm Mariana Vanitakis from Brussels, and uh, today I will be joined by Akin Anderson uh, from uh, Leid and then Marcus Ollenbach uh, from Heidelberg uh, to uh, talk about update on the management of ampullary lesions or whatever you wanted to learn and never uh, dared ask about management of ampullary lesions. So before we uh, dive into the subject, uh, first uh, reminder, uh, ESGD Days 2024 abstract submission and all you lucky members can have an extension until November 30th next week. So either your member, you can extend and still submit either, you can become a member and still have some more days to send that, that good quality abstract that you have waiting for us. We'll be uh, very happy to have you on board in Berlin. So uh, we can start now. So I'm very happy to uh, give uh, uh, the air to Akin, who's going to talk about uh, uh, a bit the, the 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 basics, let's say, uh, with some technical uh, a technical overview about management and uh, um, endoscopic endoscopic treatment of um, ampullary lesions. Please, Akin. So thank you, Mariana, for this uh, kind introduction, and. Welcome, uh, dear fellow endoscopists, on this very special evening. Uh, special for three reasons, actually. First, uh, belated happy birthday to you, Mariana. Second, we have it's election day in the Netherlands, so it's uh, uh, well, it's uh, eventful. And third, we're going to talk about the management of ampullary tumors. And I prepared uh, a presentation for you based upon the 2021 ESDE guideline on the management of ampullary lesions on the. Uh, eight most important uh, recommendations, and I'm giving an overview on how I interpret it and bring these uh, recommendations into practice. So, disclosures, I don't have any related to the subject, but I do have a disclaimer. Please note that several recommendations have limited evidence levels, and I demonstrate techniques that work for me but there are multiple approaches possible. And if you want to, we can discuss them later on in uh, the discussion. Now, teaching objectives for this talk are for every endoscopist, how to evaluate an ampullary lesion, and for those who dare to remove them, how to proceed and how to follow up on them. Now, for recommendation number one, ESGE recommends against diagnostic or therapeutic papillectomy when adenoma has not been proven yet. That sounds logical because you do not want to resect a healthy ampulla and you don't also, also do not want to resect an advanced lesion that is already a carcinoma because you will not be a radical in that case. You, you need surgery in some instances. Considering epidemiology, these lesions are rare. Most of them are sporadic ampullary tumors with a very low incidence of only four to six per million and you will encounter those in patients of about 60, 70 years of age. The incidence is much higher in the setting of genetic syndromes like FOP. Then you have a very high incidence and you will find these lesions at a lower age of patients. Now, epidemiology, you will usually encounter uh, the tubular villus variant of these adenomas. In some instances, when they're uh, already an adenocarcinoma, as you can see here in uh, the pictures below. And obviously, you cannot resect those because you will not be radical. Other types of ampullary tumors uh, may involve lipomas, fibromas, uh, variants of those. And in some instances, you may even encounter a neuroendocrine tumor. We hear from Marcus if you or can also resect those. When you encounter an ampullary lesion or a suspected ampullary lesion, first have a very, very good look. And if you have the opportunity, hit that video button, make multiple pictures from several angles in order to well um, reassess them at a later point with yourself, with your colleagues or and an MDT and describe the size, the location, whether they're really ampullary or non-ampullary and describe the mucosal appearance. You can do that with either a regular gastroscope with a distal cap attached to it or use a duodenoscope. With regard to cap-assisted uh, endoscopy, it has been 
compared to the side viewing endoscope and it is uh, superior with regard to the um, assessment of the mucosal pattern and overall well endoscopy satisfaction because what we're all endoscopists everyone knows how to handle a gastroscope and with a cap uh, it's it's easy to learn but i would recommend that you also learn how to do um, side viewing endoscope handling in order to fully appreciate the uh, the ampullary region and uh, because side viewing endoscopy gives a better overview now when you encounter a lesion it may look like this this is a large interpapillary adenoma and you can see bile flowing out and sometimes there's only a little bit of aberrant tissue protruding from the papillary orifice which you can then biopsy but it may also look like this this is a large ampullary lesion with lateral spreading extension and sometimes it's very hard to even discern where the real papillary orifices are and it is very important to do so because you need to do uh, be able to place a pancreatic stent now this is with cap assisted endoscopy and as you can see here the mucosal appearance so the villus pattern is superior in uh, uh, to be assessed with cap assisted endoscopy Now, how about the origin of these lesions? Uh, there are two types of papillary lesions, papillary and ductal origin. The papillary uh, lesions originate from the uh, papillary uh, uh, mucosa and they may appear villus and may involve the peripapillary region. The introductal variants may appear as submucosal uh, lesions, usually are protruding, and sometimes you can only see some tissue uh, protruding from the ductal orifice. You usually find them as solitary adenomas, but they can have duodenal involvement as you have seen before. And when you have, uh, when you find a lesion like this, look for ulceration. Assess the F with the biopsy forceps if they are firm, uh, about the frailty, if they have spontaneous bleeding, and if they express uh, depressed or non-lifting areas in case of lateral spreading component and if they have lateral spreading component then you could do a resection at the same time as you do a papillectomy but note that you might might have a higher bleeding risk afterwards you might there is a high risk of delayed bleeding now considering tissue acquisition you need to take a lot of biopsies because the diagnostic rate of the biopsies is about 60% with a high rate of false negatives. And it is especially so in the intrapapillary lesions because there's overlaying normal mucosa. These lesions are best assessed with EOS and in some instances you can also do FNA or FNB if they are large enough. If you do biopsies, do them within 10 days if a sphincterotomy has been done. Because if you wait too long, you've got a lot of scarring tissue and that may inhibit proper assessment. Now, take at least six biopsies and be, have a low threshold for calling in a second expert pathologist for reviewing the slides. Now, concerning recommendation number two, ESGE recommends endoscopic ultrasound and MRI MRCP for staging of the ampullary tumors. MRI is superior in assessing ductal ingrowth or determining if there is focal stricturation in the distal end of the CBD. And it is best for, uh, has the best performance for nodal staging. Although, and perhaps we will hear that in Marcus's update, it is not significantly better as compared to EUS or CT. And then for EUS staging, US staging has moderate sensitivity and specificity, about 80%, to stage ambulary lesions. And it can help identifying ductal extension. And it can exclude gross pancreatic invasion, uh, especially if there is a um, case of an advanced adenoma. Well, how does it work? Here we have that same submucosal lesion again. And we uh, introduce a duodenal scope, uh, sorry, an EOS scope in the duodenal bulb to assess the CBD and the PD. And here we have stack sign with the CBD, hepatic artery, portal vein. We move clockwise 
towards the pancreatic head and we see the PD coming into view, cutting across with the CBD through the pancreatic head and you see normal pancreatic head tissue here. So it's not an adenocarcinoma of the pancreatic head and we are at the level of the ampulla now, then go down towards the descending duodenum and there we can assess the papilla. Usually I will instill a lot of water along with a little bit of boscopen or glucagon and there we have the ampullary mass, the CBD and PD at one and two o'clock. There you can see the lesion in relation to the CBD and PD. Here there's uh, an image, a still image where with a lot of water and boscopen you can have very clear images and you see here that the lesion respects the a muscular wall so there's no invasion towards the pancreatic head don't forget to measure the lesion so if it's comparable to what you have seen with the endoscopic image and here we can see that there is no gross ductal infiltration a little bit of protrusion but no significant ingrowth now you can do this in like 15 minutes now concerning for recommendation number three ESGE recommends endoscopic papillectomy in patients with ampullary adenoma without introductal extension. And I have to uh, nuance that a little bit because you can resect lesions radically with a little bit of introductal ingrowth, but not more than one or two centimeters at max. And this is because of good results. If you don't have any significant doctor ingrowth regarding outcome, so technical and clinical success, morbidity and recurrence. Now, when to do and when not to do papillectomy. You can do papillectomy in case of a biopsy confirmed adenoma. I cannot stress that enough. Don't do a diagnostic procedure. It's not like doing an esophageal EMR, for example. Sometimes endoscopic staging and characterization may be difficult, but look for endoscopic suspicious signs like ulceration, bleeding, and clinical suspicious signs like jaundice or dilated PD. These may indicate advanced adenomas or even early cancers. But also um, take into account the age and patient frailty of your patient. Is papillectomy really going to be a disease modifier for your patient? Now concerning ampulectomy, papillectomy, we have the endoscopic option endoscopic papillectomy, uh, which is optimal for low-grade dysplasia lesions, sometimes also high-grade dysplasia or intermuscular cancer, uh, but not when there's lymphovascular invasion, that is LVI, on the biopsies, and with minimal ductal extension, preferably less than one, maximum two centimeters. And lateral spreading lesions, they may also be resected endoscopically. The surgical lesions, well, when you have lymphovascular invasion on the biopsies, a poor differentiation, and more than one centimeter of intraductal extension. And of course, when you find invasive disease signs during endoscopic or ultrasound uh, assessment. Now, back to the patient selection. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, you need to have a patient which, uh, who is fit for, for surgery or for your procedure with a life expectancy of well, at least five years, I would think. A patient should survive a post ampullectomy bleeding of one liter. And you may uh, you need to be in the position where you can stop anticoagulants for a couple of days. Uh, doing an aspirin is okay. So take care of your carefully patient selection. Now, for recommendation number four, ESGE recommends on block resection of ampullary adenomas up to three centimeters in diameter to achieve an R0 resection. That is very important to optimize complete resection rate and providing optimal histology and reduce your recurrence rate after endoscopic papillectomy. So if you do it, do it on block uh, and not in, in small pieces. It does not account for lateral spreading components. So take out the papilla first and then you could do uh, the lateral spreading uh, parts Second, well, how do I do it? I have prepared a little video for you, uh, how you could do it. Here we have a proven lesion. And first I would go with ERCP for 
pancreatic duct uh, cannulation, and I inject a little bit of contrast with methylene blue. And why is that? Well, I'll show you further on. If you have a lesion with a villous aspect, you can also use the methylene blue for chromo to better discern the margins of the lesion. Now take a regular polyp snare, usually a small polyp snare, and go for a backhand technique. So put it on the cranial side of the ampulla, go over the first fold so that you have the entire ampullary complex, and take really good care of resecting the entire lesion and don't take too much. So like here, I have the distal fold as well, which then risk perforation. You press down on the snare and go sideways so that you see the entire lesion, so that you see your reticle, and then hit endocut. The small polyp setting will suffice. And keep on pressing your pedal until you're through. It may take up to 10 seconds, sometimes even longer. Then quickly uh, remove your specimen with a, a rot net, get it out, and get back in within two minutes because otherwise, you have the chance of your wound bed starting to bleed. And now you see why I injected the blue, because you can easily discern the uh, pancreatic duct orifice from the CBD orifice, and which facilitates easy recannulation. Because I can't stress that enough, do your utmost to place a pancreatic stent to pre uh, prevent the chance of pancreatitis. <laughs> whoa, whoa, bro. Did you really think that the viewers didn't notice that the pancreatic stent was hanging out? Ah, uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Okay, well, let me fix it for you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you can use a, a grasping forceps to do that. So always place a pancreatic stent. Now, how far can you go? That depends on uh, the experience that is available in your center. We had a patient, an elderly patient, unfit for surgery lately with a five centimeter circular uh, duodenum adenoma involving the papilla as well. We discussed the patient at our MDT. I teamed up with my EMR colleague, did a full staging and uh, proper preparation. So we located and marked the papilla, as I showed you, resected it and snared it, stented both orifices in order to prevent stenosis. You can see it here. And then my colleague, Jurin Bonstra, that's our ESD EMR ninja, did a full demucosation of the entire lesion of the entire duodenum. And it looked like this five centimeter total mucosectomy. We put the patient on PPI, octreotide, liquid diet. And last week it looked like this. So I think we um, saved the patient from a pancreatic duodenectomy. But don't be fooled. Ampullary adenomas may appear uh, may be bigger and require more extensive resection than you might think. And I have a little video about this. Not one of my proudest uh, uh, procedures, but uh, I think it's necessary to show you here. So I noticed that I didn't get the entire lesion, so I let go of the snare and repositioned it. Put it a little bit higher up into the duodenum with now a large polyp snare and resected it again. So grasp the entire lesion, hit endocut, but still yet, I thought I did a good job or not because here you see still a large portion of the adenoma is inside you. This is all lesion, it's all muscle. So no radical resection. So I moved on, uh, attempted with a duckbill snare, sideways, other way around, and it was very hard to grasp. So then back off a little bit and revise what you're doing. A few moments later. It was way bigger than one fold. So I needed to go even one fold higher. So again, with a large polyp snare over the fold, Again, press down hard onto the dude in a wall. And now we were able to resect it. You see that there is a very large wound bed now. And again, 
do pancreatic stenting. And this was radical eventually, but you have a very large wound bed and a very high, high chance of rebleeds. So concerning recommendation number five, ESGE suggests considering surgical treatment of ampullary adenomas when endoscopic resection is just not feasible for technical reasons. Um, for example, when you have a lesion inside a diverticulum or when it is over four centimeters uh, in size, or when you have a lot of in interductal involvement over two centimeters, but still then you have to do surveillance afterwards. Well, for the treatment, you have three options. First is papillectomy, we talked about that, but for the surgical options, you have ampullectomy and pancreatico duodenectomy. The mortality rates are comparable and the morbidity rates as well. Um, I see the, our surgeons do a lot of pancreatico duodenectomy because of their experience, um, but papillectomy also has a lot of morbidity. Fortunately, low mortality, uh, about 1%. But the morbidity is um, mainly consists of bleeding, about 20%, um, acute pancreatitis, uh, 20, sometimes 30% in some series, and up to 5% chance of perforation. So do your selection carefully. Now for recommendation number six. ESGE recommends direct snare resection without submucosal injection or endoscopic peplectomy. And well, it makes sense. You have the, the bowel duct and the pancreatic duct traversing through the muscular wall. So it, uh, what is the, what is the, the, the benefit of, of injecting it like um, a normal colonic um, adenoma? It sometimes even makes it harder. There have been described some series uh, where they do the uh, submucosal injection, but I think it only makes sense if you have very ampular uh, extension of your adenoma. So the papilla doesn't lift, don't do it. Now for recommendation number seven, ESGE recommends prophylactic pancreatic duct stenting to reduce the risk of pancreatitis after endoscopic papillectomy. Now, in order to reduce risk, you have several options. For pancreatitis, you can do routine pancreatic stenting with a stent as large as, uh, as the pancreatic duct uh, lets you to, uh, at least five French, preferably seven uh, French. You can use a fenestrated stent, if you can't give uh, rectal NSAIDs, do aggressive rehydration with uh, Ranger's lactate. And uh, to prevent bleeding, you can also stent the pancreatic duct. And if you have a firm or very narrow um, protrusion of the, the common bowel duct, also do sphincterotomy of the bowel duct and stent that as well. If you have a very large wound bed, you can apply APC or um, coagula coagulation with the, uh, the tip of the snare or if you ran into trouble with a very large wound bed, you can also apply agents, topical agents like hemospray. And then make sure that you really have the orifice stented in order to prevent uh, pancreatitis. Now, for the last recommendation, number eight, ESGE recommends long-term monitoring of patients after endoscopic papillectomy or surgical ampillectomy based upon your duodenoscopy with biopsies of the scar and of any abnormal areas within the first three months, six months, 12 months. And after the first year, you can do it yearly for at least five years. Everyone can do that, but you have to do it with either cap assisted endoscopy or the side viewing endoscope. So make yourself efficient at using a duodenoscope scope as well. Now, considering follow-up, in uh, several, series, several series, we see that the success of peplectomy is about 80%. Recurrence rates after five years are about 15 to 17, 18%, um, as mentioned as in a recent meta-analysis. And mind to also do colonoscopy uh, to screen for synchronous polyps of the colon. Now, to summarize all this, when you see an ampullary adenoma, evaluate, prepare, and be proficient. Or become so, of course. ESGE and UAG um, offer a lot of uh, and increasing uh, opportunities to become proficient as a colonoscopist, EMR doctor, uh, ERCPist. So 
I think to be uh, to do successful ampulectomies, you need to be an experienced ERCPist and also be proficient in EMR and complication management. Don't forget that. So papillectomy is a good therapy for biopsy-proven adenomas. It is contraindicated in suspected cancers. I think then in these cases you can better do a, a ampulectomy or pancreaticoduodenectomy. It is not contraindicated in lateral or uh, periampulary extensions. It is successful in experienced hands, but often complicated by pancreatitis, bleeding, uh, but fortunately mortality is rare. And finally, remember, we are treating pre-neoplastic lesions, so don't take unnecessary risks, especially in elderly patients. A final tip, the um, guideline, the 2021 guideline, uh, on page three has a decision algorithm. So if you have a patient with an adenoma, revise the, uh, the decision algorithm, it works fine. And I think it's uh, one of the better readable uh, guidelines that EGE has. So with this, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. So uh, thank you very much, Akin, for this, this beautiful presentation. You're not seen, evidently, you're not only the ninja of a pilectomy, but also of the ninja of the <laughs> creative endoscopic video section. So <laughs> congrats on that. And to your tweet. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so um, we have some questions uh, from, uh, from our audience. So it's about uh, uh, adverse events, so uh, risk of pancreatitis. So uh, there is a concern about injecting uh, methylene blue in the pancreatic duct. Would that be a, a risk factor finally to increase the risk of pancreatitis? And as we're in this in this um, area, another question uh, or statement, mostly a concern, is that maybe we're overrating the risk of pancreatitis because it's true that the um, the stent, uh, the prophylactic stent data was before uh, the era we gave everybody uh, rectal NSAIDs. Uh, uh, and uh, what do you think about this kind of data? Is 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 do we do you 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 uh, you over uh, you you highlighted the use of the stent, but is it based on maybe uh, older data? Well, uh, concerning the first question, uh, ba, thank you for your question. Um, does methylene blue increase the risk of pancreatitis? Uh, I have not found any data on that yet. But um, what I usually do is uh, make a, a not a full but a partial pancreaticogram with normal contrast and just at the end I give a little bit of methylene blue so I just mark the ampullary uh, orifices and considering well uh, the data on to place or not to place a pancreatic stent yeah um, I think there is data on on uh, the advantage of placing a pancreatic stent the numbers uh, vary a little bit from 10 up to 30 percent so I think that because you're doing an invasive procedure, justifies uh, placement of pancreatic stents, and it also reduces the chance of uh, uh, fibrosis of the pancreatic duct orifice later on. It might also help if there's bleeding, just to have an idea about your landmarks and uh, avoid. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, another two two questions before we go with Marcus, and then we have a good uh, session of Q and A at the end. Um, so again, for the stent, uh, any use of um, biodegradable pancreatic stents? Uh, excellent question. Biodegradable. I haven't used them yet. Um, uh, I have not seen data on these. Um, on the other hand, well, um, what would be the use of, bio of yeah, a biodegradable stent? Um, you need to revise your, your uh, wound bed within three months. So that would be also uh, adequate timing to, res to remove your pancreatic stent. Uh, and maybe a last question, and then the rest we're going to ask, ask with Marcus about uh, endoscopic um, of sphincterotomy. Can you do a, a papillectomy after a previous sphincterotomy, and how does it affect? Yeah, usually, we advise against doing a, a sphincterotomy beforehand because you have a scarring uh, reaction, and that may inhibit a radical resection. So it's, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. It can be done. Um, but you risk an, uh, an R1 resection. So preferably not. Okay, so there's more questions. We'll keep them hot from the oven and uh, ask everything uh, afterwards when uh, Marcus has finished his talk. So thank you very much, Akin. 
Excellent. Thanks. Um, so uh, next it's Marcus uh, Hollenbach, and he's going to give us all the recent stuff that has been published. So, uh, Marcus, we're also very excited to see what's new. Yeah, Mariana, thank you very much for this kind introduction. So I have a little bit of boring kind uh, task after this, after this great presentation from Aiken, but I hope I can provide you some new and also interesting data uh, on uh, endoscopic papillectomy. So um, there are three topics I want to talk about. Um, I will present you some new data on outcomes of endoscopic papillectomy, especially in sub uh, subtypes of the, the lesions. And then we'll show you some innovations, how we can uh, prevent complications after the procedure and show you some technical skills improvements you might use in your everyday uh, EP. So let's start. Um, I will start with a subgroup of the patients and the so-called um, uh, ampullary lesions that are associated with a familiar adenomatosis polyposis syndrome, a FAP syndrome. Um, you might know that in such patients, the papilla ophata is the location in the gastrointestinal tract with the highest rate of neoplasia after the patient underwent the proctocolectomy. And so doing every surveillance endoscopy, the papilla ophata has to be inspected either by a side viewing endoscope or with a cap-assisted uh, gastroscopy. And in a, a large uh, study who analyzed the natural history of such lesions, they found that in about 71% of the patients with um, a lesion of tampula ophata in these patients, there was no progression over a time of about seven or eight years. That means more than two thirds of the lesions did not differ, did not show any progression and uh, were not there were not an indication for resection. On the other hand, about 28 patients showed a, um, a progression into, um, uh, into a, inter epithelial neoplasia, high-grade dysplasia, or in two cases, already an ampullary cancer. So we know in such patients, we need to do a surveillance endoscopy. But if we have a progression of the uh, disease, of the lesion, how we should treat it. Is also endoscopic papillectomy in such patients a feasible option? And uh, me and my own group, we were able to perform uh, analysis. We compared uh, sporadic lesions of the papilla of fata and uh, lesions associated with the FAP. And we clearly found that the endoscopic papillectomy is as safe and as efficient as in uh, sporadic lesions and also for the FAP patient, it is the method of first choice and you can use the recommendations of the ESG GEAT guideline about indications and the limits of about three centimeter and so on that Aiken presented um, in her in this perfect lecture. So uh, the, the first um, thing I want to talk about you, this is in such patient, you can use an endoscopic papillectomy for the treatment of the patients. And then uh, another subgroup is important then you have also patients with neuroendocrine lesions of the papilla of Fata, who is a relatively rare lesion, but is an endoscopic pectability also the first uh, choice to treat such patients? And in this case, uh, we have clearly say no, because if you have a look at the data that was published in neuroendocrinology, um, then you see that uh, for such lesions, the endoscopic papillectomy group has only a rate of complete resection of about 50% compared to surgical interventions like the surgical ampullectomy or the pancreatic adrenomectomy. They were quite higher. And uh, this led us to the conclusion that for this subgroup, the EP is not a feasible option. If you have endocrine, the new endocrine lesion of the papilla of Hata, then you should uh, go for surgery because you have a high risk of an incomplete resection. So, but now let's come to the traditional lesions um, of the uh, ampullary adenoma, maybe in the carcinoma. There was a huge meta-analysis about the uh, risk of a recurrence. If you have a look of uh, um, 
uh, meta-analysis in the past, then there was risk between 10 and 30 percent. And this recent meta-analysis showed that after one year, the risk for recurrence is about 13 percent. And this slightly increases to five years uh, to about 15 percent. That means that in patients uh, where we perform an endoscopic papillectomy, we still have to do surveillance endoscopies for the first five years, as you um, was presented by Aiken before. So, but what about the rate of complete resections? If you look at meta-analysis, then you found complete resection rates between 50 and 100%. That means you have a huge span and huge difference between the, um, the, the study groups and the centers performing papillectomy. And maybe it's uh, be related to a low level or the high level uh, center who is performing EP and also uh, recent studies came to different results. If you see here a multi-center study of 227 patients, they performed the endoscopic papillectomy in, in more than 100 patients, uh, in more than 100 patients, that means more than 30%, they did not uh, get an endoscopic um, uh, complete resection of the lesion. And even if they used an additional endoscopic papillectomy, there were about 40 or 50 patients that were are that, that received an R1 resection and need to undergo surgery in advance. And that means that we still are not there where we want to be, that we achieve resection rates of 80 or 90 percent, uh, what we should aim for. And uh, really, it depends on the center's experience and an experience of the treating endoscopist. And uh, we highly recommend to uh, to go to the ESG guideline and um, make yourself confident when you're performing endoscopic papillectomy. And this study also shows that there are two major adverse events, naming the post ESCP pancreatitis and the um, early or delayed bleeding after the uh, papillectomy in about uh, 17 and 11% of the cases. And these data were also confirmed by another study analyzing more than 100 endoscopic papillectomies. And here you also see that uh, we had a, a delayed bleeding rate of about 10%. And in this, uh, I would say it's a very complex diagram, but this clearly shows you that you have still a biopsy error that um, Aiken also presents. It, uh, the biopsy error is between 30 and 50%. That means you have some lesions that were classified as neoplastic lesion. And in the end, after the endoscopic papillectomy, it's only uh, chronic inflammation, so or non-neoplastic lesion. And on the other hand, you still have lesion that you uh, classified as adenoma. And in the end, this were uh, high-grade dysplasia or even a dermal carcinoma. So that means our pre-interventional staging is still not perfect. And maybe the use of advanced um, uh, artificial intelligence or other systems in the future will help us to better discriminate the patients between um, an adenoma and a carcinoma. So regarding the carcinomas, um, this is still a matter of debate if uh, the patients with an ampullary carcinoma should undergo an attempt for an endoscopic resection or should directly go for surgery. And in this study, they analyzed uh, more than 100 uh, patients with high-grade dysplasia or adenocarcinoma, and they either received an endoscopic papillectomy alone, if feasible, that means in T1 cancers, or they go for an additional surgery. And you can see here, uh, in this uh, crossing curves and overall survival, that in the majority of cases, if it is feasible to do an R0 resection for T1 cancers, also in a matched analysis is demonstrated here, uh, then also in a long-term uh, follow-up, it is feasible to do an endoscopic papillectomy, but you have to be sure that you do an unblock resection and you have uh, clear margins, and then you can do an endoscopic follow-up. In such situation, 41 cancers, it is not always necessary to perform an additional surgery, but you have to be clear that it's only T1 and that you have no lymph node metastasis. For all other situation, T1B, T2 cancers, and higher stage carcinoma, uh, the patients have to undergo surgery, either limited by the uh, transdudinal surgical ampullectomy or uh, radical with a pancreatic adudinectomy. So, 
now presented you some data on the outcomes, but um, what is more important, even in the situation that I showed you that the bleeding is a very often complication of the papillectomy in about 10% of the patients, uh, what can we do to uh, circumvent such complications? And the first thing is that we have to care about the patient we select for an endoscopic papillectomy. This study here analyzed if the use of our anticoagulants or antiblated agents um, is linked to a higher risk of bleeding. And in these patients, they, uh, they used uh, platelets or anticoagulants, and there was uh, interruption according to the ESG guideline. That means uh, you have a hippocrine bridging if necessary or not, or only a simple interruption of the uh, the dosage and in this analysis they found that the use of anticoagulant agent has a fourfold higher risk uh, for a delayed uh, bleeding after papillectomy, but not the use of antiplatelets. That means um, there is no problem if you have uh, aspirin or other antiplatelets, but if you have a patient who is under direct oral anticoagulants or um, uh, or vitamin K antagonists, then you have to do a uh, uh, intensive uh, surveillance of the patient if there is a delayed bleeding and maybe for such uh, patients uh, intervention like clipping also could be beneficial. In this regard, there was a prospective trial analyzing endoscopic papillectomies and it was randomized if the patients received the prophylactic clipping after the papillectomy or not. And in this study, you have a delayed bleeding rate of 32% in the non-clipping group and a bleeding rate of 15% in the clipping group. I think this is a huge and important uh, difference, but however, the statistical calculation was not significant because of the overlapping confidence intervals. And that means based on this study, there is no clear recommendation to do a prophylactic clipping in every patient after endoscopic papillectomy, but maybe for such high risk patients I presented before with um, anticoagulants, this could be a valuable option. And there was another study who analyzed the clipping with uh, a novel clip with the uh, the shoe clip, who is available until 17 millimeters. And also in that study, um, here was a, a tendency with a lower rate of delayed bleeding, but also in this group, the, uh, there was no statistical significance. Another idea to prevent the post ESAP bleeding is the prophylactic argon plasma coagulation of uh, the wound bed. So this was also a prospective multi-center trial and they randomized uh, 54 patients and they received either a prophylactic APC therapy or non-APC therapy. And then they, uh, they compared the primary outcome, the immediate bleeding and also uh, the outcome within two months. And they found if you have a look at the delayed bleeding, they only had eight patients in the APC group and six patients in the non-APC group that are um, a relatively low uh, patient count, but in the end, the, um, the statistical difference was not significant and all the other um, outcomes were also not uh, significantly different. That means at the moment, there is no evidence to recommend the APC therapy to reduce delayed bleeding. What about other um, other mechanisms to reduce the bleeding. This study analyzed uh, the hemostatic gel. It is um, not a poor study, it is available in the European Union. It's uh, another type, but it's uh, comparable and it's, it's used in, in the Asian country. And they used this one for um, either a endoscopic papillectomy or a sphincterotomy. And they also randomized the patients into two groups allocated. And in the end, they found that in these patients, uh, the delayed bleeding was also not statistically significant different. That means um, you do not do a mistake if you use uh, such a gel after endoscopic papillectomy, but at the moment there are no data supporting it in general use to reduce any risk of bleeding. And also there was a study analyzing not the gel, but the, 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 the powder, the hypostatic spray, and uh, there were only 40 patients that were randomized in uh, two groups. And also, if you see here, the delayed bleeding rates, there was no significant difference between the groups. That means also if you use 
uh, in general, the hemostatic spray after candoscopic papillectomy, it uh, does not show any improvement on outcomes, in, in particular in the delayed bleeding. And this is shown uh, here, delayed bleeding were 13 and 5, but however, it was not significantly different. That means for all the devices um, and all the techniques to potentially reduce the bleeding risk, at the moment, there is no supporting evidence. On the other hand, for uh, some techniques like the clipping or um, like the spray, you have a tendency, but I think there are additional studies in the future necessary to finally answer this question. So and in the last minutes, I'll show you some um, technical improvements. So the first thing what a lot of people consider is, okay, if I do uh, endoscopic papillectomy and I have my electric uh, device, what mode, what type of mode I should use? Yeah? And I can uh, just uh, present you that he is using the endocut mode and then think this is a valuable option. And then in this trial, they compare the endocut mode with the autocut mode. The main difference between the endocut and the autocut is that in the endocut mode, um, you have a, a cut duration and then an interval with a coagulation. And in the autocut mode, you have a continuous cut without a coagulation. And if you have a look at the outcomes here, um, then there were no significant difference in the adverse events and the delayed bleeding was not different between both groups. However, if you use the, the endocut mode, then you have a reduced number of uh, artifacts on the re uh, resected specimen and you have a reduced rate of immediate bleeding. Um, however, the delayed bleeding was not affected, but based on this study, the endocut uh, mode uh, can be preferred over the autocut mode because of the secondary outcomes. There was also an in vitro study. Um, they analyzed uh, different types of electric modes and to um, to be honest, I did not understand everything what the, they did because it was a really complex paper. But in the end, they came to the conclusion that they support the endocut mode and you should prefer the endocut I compared to the endocut Q mode because the resected specimen um, are much better re regarding the histopathologic analysis compared to the endocut Q. So. Then we are often faced with ampullary lesions that uh, show an introductal extension either of the pancreatic duct or of the bile duct. And I can show you before that we should do an EUS to adequately stage these patients. But however, um, we know that with an endoscopic papillectomy alone, we are often not receive an R0 state because we are often not able to completely remove the introductal extension. And in this study, it was analyzed if we compare the endoscopic papillectomy with an ablative therapy, that means a radio, radio frequency ablation of the bile and or the pancreatic duct. And you can see here that we have a technical success of 100% and we have a clinical success of more than uh, 90 uh, patient uh, person um, in short-term surveillance and more than 76 person in long-term surveillance uh, regarding the complete resection and the recurrences. And this study therefore shows that for such reasons with an introductory extension, the radio frequency is an adequate uh, solution to uh, do an EP and to prevent the surgery. And this was also confirmed by an Italian working group and they clearly recommended that we should use a dedicated follow-up after this procedure, after the EP and the RFA, at least at uh, three months with the strand removal. And then if we have negative margins and no sign of a remnant or recurrent lesion after six months, and um, if we have a recurrent or remnant lesion, then do another EP with RFA and then have a look at another three months. And only if we are not able to uh, completely remove the lesion endoscopically, then we should um, consider surgery. So another idea is a so-called underwater or gel immersion endoscopic papillectomy. That means 
yeah, the reading starts now. Um, that means based on the colonoscopy experience, you can uh, use water or gel in this situation and uh, fill the, the duodenum. And the idea is that you reduce the tension of the duodenal wall, like in the, in the colon, like in the colonic wall, and then that you have a better protrusion of the ampullary lesion. And then uh, you could more easily resect uh, the lesion with the snare compared to the air insufflation. You can see here the uh, gel immersion, and then uh, there is the snare is opened, and then the snare is surrounded to the lesion. And you can see in this video also that this was a complex situation because it was a patient who underwent um, a gastrointestinal surgery and the authors, they used a double balloon enteroscopy to enter the ampulla that makes the resection more complex. And now you see here the classical endoscopic papillectomy with the snare surrounded and then the lesion is cut it underwater or in the gel immersion. And then you need a little bit of patience. So, and then and finally, the lesion is cut. It. You can remove the resected specimen, and then you see uh, the round bed. And in this situation, it also was a very effective um, endoscopic papillectomy. There were only two cases reported for underwater for gel immersion, and few, uh, future studies have to prove if this is a valuable option. Also, in patients, uh, they did not receive any uh, surgical intervention before, so, uh, and maybe it's, it's worthwhile to analyze it for a classical endoscopic papillectomy. And another tip would be the so-called tip-in endoscopic papillectomy. And in particular, in patients who have a dextrapapillary diverticulum, um, that means a diverticle a bit uh, close to the uh, ampullary lesion. In such patients, the risk of a perforation is very high because you have often not a perfect view uh, into the diverticulum and then maybe uh, cause a perforation with the resection. And the authors here um, used an um, adaption where they used the snare, a bigger coagulation and the tip in on the top of the, of the uh, polary lesion and then they surround the snare and then they cut the lesion. And then also they have a very good uh, result and they secured the diverticulum and prevent um, a perforation. So this could be a valuable option for patients with a diverticulum in, uh, related to the ampullary lesion. So, and this is um, my uh, last slide. We also analyzed um, the endoscopic papillectomy for lesions of the minor papilla. The lesions of the minor papilla are very, very rare, um, about 10% um, of all, 1% uh, of all um, endoscopic papillectomies we did in, in our huge cohort. And we here found that you can also do the papillectomy for such lesions. You have comparable outcomes and a low complication rate. And if you ever found the lesion of the minor papilla, then you also could very easily do endoscopic papillectomy. And now I conclude, uh, we still have a high heterogeneity um, in the complete resection after endoscopic papillectomy in the published literature. And um, I think there are still more data needed to finally recommend the endoscopic papillectomy for ampullary cancers for invasive lesions. And on the other hand, the endoscopic papillectomy is a suitable option for fab-related um, diseases, but not for newer endocrine tumors. Here you should directly go for surgery. And at the moment, um, we have no convincing tool for a prophylactic hemostasis. Uh, there are some, um, some supporting data from the clips, but at the moment there is no significant um, difference and so no significant um, improve in the outcomes. And if you have a lesion with an interduct extension, then you should use a radiofrequency ablation. And maybe uh, future studies will analyze the underwater or gel immersion method for selected cations. And I showed you uh, that you can use the papillectomy for the minor papilla lesions. And I finished my presentation I, and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Marcus, for this uh, very thorough and uh, um, uh, complete uh, uh, review of the recent literature. Uh, so a lot of new things there and a lot of research ideas. So uh, we have a couple of more than a couple of questions here. So first of all, a little semantics here for Marcus. Um, do we say endoscopic ampulectomy or papillectomy? And is it, uh, is it, what's that? Is it the <laughs> so, size? Is it, what is it? <laughs> so this is, uh, I think you can, you can choose between, um, in the literature, the most common term is the endoscopic papillectomy, but I think it's not a, it's not a mistake. If you say endoscopic ampulectomy, it's quite the same, yeah, but prefer papillectomy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, we talked about the stenting, and we show that now with all your techniques, uh, uh, the hemostasis, the clipping, uh, the, uh, the, the powders, it's probably better at least to put a pancreatic stent to, to prevent uh, any clogging of the pancreatic duct. What okay. about uh, the biliary stenting? So when do we do biliary sphincterotomy? When do we put a stent? Um, you can both answer the question. Hey, can you first, me, maybe? Yeah, I'll, I'll make an attempt. Um, so when to place a, a, a CBD stent? Well, yeah. uh, not regularly. So uh, the data shows that uh, usually well, uh, pancreatitis is the problem um, and, and pancreatic uh, duct uh, stenosis, but not so much for the CBD. So not on a regular basis. You can do it if you have uh, a concomitant stenosis of the distal bowel duct or if you have ductal ingrowth that you are not going to treat in the same session. Uh, so if you have a large wound bed and intraductal uh, infiltration, you can just stand and, and come back later to do RFA, for example. Um, and if you have bleeding, so if you have uh, bleeding um, from the CBD orifice that you cannot manage with coagulation, for example, you can put in a fully covered metal stent. I think these would be the indications, but uh, perhaps you can um, add on to me, uh, Marcus. Yeah, I fully agree with you. But I would say if you do um, a concomitant um, RFA of the biliary tract, yeah. um, then I would also prefer implanting a stent uh, for two reasons. So the, the first reason is to prevent the stenosis, or two, this is very rare in the bowel tract. And the second thing is um, to prevent uh, delayed perforation. So I would go for a fully covered metal stent there. And then indication to do sphinc biliary sphincterotomy after finish the ampulectomy if you're planning to stent. I mean, it's. I would say it's up to you. Um, it's not not hundred percent necessary. If you have a a simple cannulation of the bile duct and then you can easily put in a stent and you do not have a stenosis, I'm not sure if this is necessary. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So bleeding now. So we also have some interesting questions on bleeding. Does the size of the apolectomy impact the risk of bleeding? And will it change a bit your uh, prevention methods or if you're going to keep the patient uh, uh, inside another night? Yeah, there, there are some data, but they are conflicting regarding the bleeding. That means if you have an ampullary lesion of about 20 millimeter, then you have a higher risk of bleeding. And you have higher risk of bleeding if you have a laterally bleeding lesion because then you have a larger wound bed compared to a, a simple um, endoscopic papillectomy. Um, I would say if you have uh, the feeling that you um, have a high risk of bleeding and in the, the high risk patients, with, uh, they will see anti-coagulant of therapy, then I would try to, to use a clip or another, uh, the powder or the gel. Um, but as I told you before, there are no, no supporting data for this at the moment to do it regularly. I would do it in selected occasions with very large reasons or with a very high risk of bleeding uh, from the patient comorbidities. And uh, yeah, so what... most of the bleedings are within the first 72 hours. So we keep our patients in for uh, yeah. two nights. And if, if they're stable after that, we let them go. But uh, there's no... Um, well, hard data on that, but uh, that is how we do it. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Same here, yeah. And uh, you talked about homostatic powder and the Asian study, which was another kind of um, uh, yeah. preparation. Uh, what about Purastat? Because we know that's used in the UK. Um, as far as I know, uh, there are some ongoing studies analyzing the Purastat, but at the moment they are not published uh, so far. And um, 
I think if we have another type of gel and uh, we have these results, I do not really expect that we have different results with the, uh, the poor stat gel. Because um, from a chemical compound view, that I could, that uh, they are quite comparable. So I think um, we can use this, but I think we have more to focus on the patients to identify where we really use um, a prophylactic clipping gel powder, whatever, and not doing in general. I mean, it's uh, the same like the clipping after the polypectomy. Uh, you also do not a clipping for for every patient for every polyp you remove because we know that is that there's no benefit, but in selected cases you can, and maybe we should go for this in the future. Okay, uh, so we a little bit of about recurrence now. Uh, so uh, there is a uh, questions about uh, recurrence regarding um, uh, if we do some thermal ablation on the edges, if that can help. And also, if it since it's not so uncommon, we can deal. We can can we still deal with it as endoscopies? Can we deal with it endoscopically? I think that depends a little bit on the extent. So, if it's introductal extension and um, you do RFA, for example, there's an option that you combine it with cholangioscopy. So you can assess whether you are radical or not. If there's a lot of introductal extension or progression, then I think I think you should reconsider surgery uh, as well. If you have a lateral spreading lesion, uh, well, you basically treat it as a an, an, uh, colon adenoma. So you could uh, treat the, the margins, but I think a radical resection uh, with uh, uh, extra margin around the ampulla is, uh, is, is the best option. Yeah. But to be honest, we don't know. We have no data yeah. on that. Uh, based on our experience in colonoscopy and lateral spreading leadings, it makes sense to do that. But um, to be honest, we don't know. And for the for the lateral spreading part, I think it's it's it makes sense because for the duodenal yeah. adenomas, it's 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 it seems to uh, uh, reduce a bit the the, the recurrence rate. So it yeah. could be yeah. Yeah, but uh, I, I think for for a ten millimeter lesion, it makes no sense. But for yes. a lateral spreading lesion, yes, of course. So there's also some questions about uh, when you uh, when you're doing the workup. Uh, so, uh, can, do you always have to do MRI uh, US? Can we go immediately uh, to uh, to resection if you see uh, an, uh, uh, an apiary lesion and you have done biopsies and it's low grade dysplasia? Do you always have to go for some uh, uh, diagnostic intermediate diagnostic procedure as US or, an, or MRI? Well, I think the guideline is not definite on that point. Uh, um, it is well since US is so readily available. I think it's. Uh, uh, one of the first thing you could do, yes, of course, you can resect a lesion of, of 10 millimeters uh, without any other workup, but you have the chance that you miss introductal uh, extension and that you have a high rate of recurrence, uh, which you could have known if you've done the workup before. And MRI, well, as, why, as we uh, uh, told, told you about, it, it is uh, very adequate for nodular staging, especially if you have high risk a stigmata of the lesion like depression or spontaneous bleeding etc so the more risky the lesion the more workup you have to do i think yeah and i, I think it's really necessary if you have um, a proven ampullary cancer and it's a, maybe a t1 and um, you aim for endoscopic resection then you have to do an mri before yes of course and mtd discussion i think of course yeah Okay, well, I think that uh, it's been uh, it's been a very good webinar, and we're still uh, everybody's still there. So it's uh, maybe we have uh, maybe a time for a quick quick last question. I think this is really for uh, uh, also for for the fellows out there when they that maybe not going to do immediately uh, uh, papillectomy, but uh, you talked uh, Akin, you talked about the submucosal ones that are sometimes tricky to diagnose because you don't have the mucosal changes and it could be also like a big infidibulum uh, with nothing behind it. So uh, what would be the threshold to send this patient for US or do you send all of them? What, would you, what tips would you give a fellow that's doing his, uh, his upper GI program and see this, this big, this big uh, bulky papilla uh, where he's not sure that there's something inside? A normal overlying tissue. Ah, it's, it's, it's a tricky question indeed. So is it a large papilla or is it really an, an uh, adenoma? Uh, I think that the threshold for doing an EOS is, uh, in our center is quite low. Um, 
because if you have a, a normal pillar, it, it's it's usually quite flat on the duodenal surface. And if it's a, a really an anoma, you will see it on EOS. You will see it has a, it, is, it has a volume uh, within it. And from one centimeter, I think it's uh, uh, you have um, a higher rate of a diagnostic puncture if it's only five millimeters or so. Uh, yeah, trying to puncture it is is uh, you no well uh, next to futile. Um, but in doubt, just do an EOS and uh, save your patient a lot of extra diagnostics afterwards. Okay, well then I think that was, uh, we can end up with that. <laughs> I think it was a good message. Uh, so I would like to thank you both very much uh, about this, uh, this really this excellent session where I think uh, everybody learned a lot. Uh, again, uh, guys, uh, don't forget, extension until November 30, send out your data there. Uh, we want your data and we want, would like to have you in Berlin. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, extend a big thanks to our uh, webinar uh, team behind the screen, which is uh, David and Gabby, and also invite you next week, November 29th, one day before the uh, end of the uh, extension for the abstract, uh, where we're going to talk about therapeutic US, uh, with uh, another great team, Mark Giovannini, Michael Brosnik, and Giuseppe Vanella. So with that, uh, I would like uh, to thank um, my uh, co-panelists, uh, David and Gabby, and all the attendants that stayed uh, with us until now. And have a very, very nice uh, evening. Bye-bye. Thanks for attention. Bye. Bye-bye. See you next time. Bye.